So I wanted just to welcome everybody today to our Wednesday webinar. And we have a very distinguished guest today that you've already seen um, and that you're hearing as he's setting up his PowerPoint presentation, um, John Ross, Dr. John Ross Rizzo. Um, I wanted to just say welcome again to everyone for carving time out of your day in the middle of the afternoon. We have some people across the pond internationally who have joined us. So I want to say thank you to our international um, CHM family. Um, also wanted to say thank you again to our sponsors. I do this every time um, to Allergan and Biogen. They provided funding to help us coordinate these webinars for our CHM family. Um, so today is going to be a great day, and uh, we're all going to learn some new things from um, Dr. Rizzo. I always smile because I have to just say, I told him already, I love his name, Rizzo, Dr. Rizzo, J.R. Rizzo. <laughs> um, so I'll stop there, I'll, otherwise I'll get giggly. Um, Dr. Rizzo is with us. He is on faculty at NYU. Um, he is a doctor of physiology and disability medicine. I wanted to make sure I got that correct. Um, and he is now sitting on our board of directors. Um, he came on board last year and he has CHM. So a great package um, with a great name. Oh, I did it. I said it again. Um, and so I will let him talk to us about a topic that, as I said, is new, but it is, I think, really interesting because it's for our more advanced CHMers. Um, potentially new therapies or wearables, I'll say, that will be able to make our lives much more easy, hopefully. So I'm going to go ahead, um, John, and I'm going to stop my video, let you take over. And sure. I'll be um, just one other quick point, folks. We're sure. using the webinar feature. So as you have questions, there is a tab at the bottom. It's a little thing that says chat. Go ahead and type your questions in, and I will be fielding that um, and forwarding them on to John. Yep. All right. Well, here we go. Thank you. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Beth. And I just want to, you know, start off by saying, um, you know, it's just awesome to be with you all. Um, you know, thanks to the um, the incredible uh, CHM community and to all of those who are here today and also who will listen, who help support the CHM community. As I mentioned uh, to some of our board of directors, also to Beth and to Kathy, you know, the CHM family has been a beacon of hope for me personally for, for decades at this point. Um, I've been dealing with CHM personally for about three decades. Um, and so, you know, all the work that's, um, you know, that's kind of performed under the hood of CHM has just really been uh, fantastic and, and helped me take next steps professionally and personally. So, so thanks to you all. So, um, you know, I'm from a big Italian family, uh, so feel free to interrupt me at any point in time. It'll be like Sunday dinner. Uh, I can't say we're having those right now, um, you know, given the pandemic, but I do hope everyone is safe and sound back at home. Um, and uh, so feel free to, to throw, a, uh, you know, kind of a question or anything into the chat box and uh, Beth will, um, will interrupt me at any point in time. I'd like to keep this as informal as possible. I've thrown in kind of a lot of just information um, just to see if we can get any questions, get people's thoughts, just show you a little bit of, of what we've been working on for the better part of a decade now um, at NYU School of Medicine and also with our Tandon School of Engineering. And I'd love to get your thoughts. Um, big believer in the mastermind um, and we can all do it together. So, um, you know, feel free um, again at any point. Please don't hesitate. So um, uh, I'll be speaking today a little bit about powering up with wearables and assistive techs. Uh, some of our take, a little bit of background for those who aren't as familiar with the world of assistive tech uh, beyond kind of the primary mobility tools that we use um, within visual impairment and then what we like to consider sensory augmentation. I do hail from um, NYU School of Medicine. I run a division of innovation and technology there, um, which has been a lot of fun. Happy to uh, talk about that offline. Um, and um, I'm a, a, a clinically trained in disability medicine or physiatry. Um, for those who are not familiar with, uh, with that field, um, we treat a whole host of different disabilities um, and acute inpatient rehabilitation medicine uh, was actually um, conceived of um, as it relates to tertiary care um, uh, at NYU uh, about seven or eight decades ago um, with, with Howard Rusk um, as the forefather. Um, and I get to collaborate uh, very frequently with uh, neurologists, biomedical engineers, um, mechatronics experts, et cetera. So it's been a lot of fun. 
So uh, just in terms of how housekeeping uh, and conflictual interests, um, NYU um, has uh, moved forward and decided to patent some of um, the technology that I will be discussing with you. Um, you know, it's, it's our definite desire to make sure that we can launch these in the commercial marketplace, um, which we are taking steps to do. Um, so I do uh, disclose those conflictual interests um, here. So um, the world of sensory augmentation, you know, uh, this dates back um, uh, millennia. You know, even if we go back to um, ancient Roman times, it's been said that Emperor Nero held a polished emerald in front of his eyes to, to reduce glare when he, watched, when he watched gladiators fight. And when he actually read books, it's been said that he used a large glass bowl filled with water, um, which magnified the print. Uh, if we look at some ancient writing from the Inuits, um, they used to use flattened walrus ivory in front of their faces um, to block the sun's rays uh, to improve vision. Um, and if we go to our, um, you know, extremely well-known uh, uh, Ben Franklin um, in the uh, 1700s, um, we saw the invention of lenses for both near and far vision or um, the inception of the bifocals. I'm also, I've also found it um, in incredible, um, if we think a little bit about what's happened with augmentation from a visual sense um, as it relates to contact lenses, and I won't uh, belabor uh, this point here, uh, but going back about uh, 500 years, uh, back to actually the days of da Vinci, um, you know, he speculated that submerging the head in a bowl of water uh, could really alter vision, and he wrote about this in, 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 his, in what uh, was called the Codex of the Eye in 1508, um, and then Descartes um, proposed another idea of actually, about actually placing glass tubes filled with uh, liquid indirect contact with the cornea. And, and that really sparked the, the evolution of the modern contact lens um, to the present day. Uh, so I won't go through all of this, but um, what I will do uh, is take a quick pause um, to tell you a little bit more about some of the inspiration um, um, from, from biology. So uh, people- hey, John Ross, I'm so sorry to interrupt you real quickly. Is it possible for you to make that a full slide, the slide mode? Because we're seeing both side by side. Oh, you're seeing my, um, you're seeing click, my, uh, yes, sir. It says click to add notes. So if you can make it full screen, that would be, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm so sorry about that. It, it's, you know what, I, I have an extra monitor for my visual impairment and it looks like it reversed the order of my screens here. So you're looking at what I'm supposed to be looking at. Um, okay. hold on a second here. Um, swap displays. How's that? There you go. Is that better? Yep. Thank you. No problem. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that you were looking at my notes. That's kind of embarrassing. Uh, but thank you for notifying me. Um, so you know all my trade secrets at this point. Uh, so <laughs> I don't think any any scandalous notes so far. So we're safe. Um, so um, I was talking a little bit about the concept of biomimicry, and you know we've been fascinated about about biology. And so I'll zoom through some of this. Um, you know, but I think this has been, um, you know, um, a very uh, illustrative of, of, of ultimately what we've settled on in terms of moving forward uh, from um, a device design. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if we look at, uh, you know, the fish, um, for example, and, and we pick the swordfish, one of um, over, you know, 33,000 species, you know, we can actually look at the size of the actual eye itself, which is in fact massive. I mean, the swordfish has a nine centimeter eye. And if you actually look at the placement of the eye relative to field of view or what's captured, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of perception, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And I'll, and I'll go back to um, differences between binocularity and depth perception and what's important for kind of understanding where things are in terms of their range relative to where I am uh, versus kind of where things are in terms of X and Y and, 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 and contrast that with field of view. Um, if I look at the penguin, you know, the penguin is fascinating. Um, in that they've evolved these mechanisms for sharper vision underwater. So if you can see on these images on the right, the lower right here, what I'm showing you here um, is, is that they have a flattened cornea. And so what happens in terms of the refraction patterns, you're able to get those, 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 those light rays um, underneath water to place uh, directly on the back of the retina, as opposed to what would happen with the, um, uh, the, the less flat or the more curved cornea um, of the actual human. Um, and so, um, you know, penguins have, have, have uh, developed these adaptations so they can do very well with perception both, um, you know, terrestrially or on land and also aquatically in water. Um, one of my favorites is the actual dragonfly um, in, in their compound eyes that have over 30,000 facets. And so they have these kind of, um, uh, these, these, these kind of little different surfaces uh, across their eye that give them essentially 360, 360 degree vision. Um, you know, another kind of quick, uh, amazing fact about dragonflies 
is they have 11 channels as compared to kind of three color channels for humans, what are known as the kind of um, the, 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 the color opsins or the channel opsins. Um, and so not only can they see multicolor, they can also see ultraviolet and, and, and polarized light. Um, there was an, an optic scientist in the 1970s named Kirschfeld who said that if the human were to have the compound eye um, <clears throat> with similar angular resolution um, of, of the dragonfly um, and we were to match it to the human, um, that the globe of the eye would probably be approximately one meter in diameter. Uh, uh, so it, it, would, it, it would be massive. Uh, but, you know, I, I pause there for a second to think about how we could create um, devices that perhaps could replicate some of what the dragonfly has done. And, and I'll come back to that briefly. Um, and then one of my favorites um, that I talk to my sons about all the time um, is the peregrine falcon. So, you know, not just in terms of speed, um, you know, but also the fact that they have uh, two fovea uh, per eye, so four total. Um, and, and some may have seen them on, um, uh, on a Discovery Channel having a a third translucent eyelid or the nictitating membrane that can kind of come across the eye and lubricate the front of the eye, but is also translucent. So while they're diving, they never lose perception, um, which is which is really uh, you know quite astounding. Um, some people say they have uh, about eight times um, uh, the the um, uh, the strength of the of the human visual system. Um, so you know, suffice it to say, you know, all these examples are incredible, and I didn't want to turn this into kind of a a biology lesson. And I'm certainly not an animal biologist, but you know, at the end of the day, what, what, what we can see here is a compare and contrast between a human um, and a duck. And, and what I've tried to highlight here is, is two important considerations when we're thinking about both a device that could help us and, and also what we have natively or what we've lost secondary to a visual impairment. And, and, and one of those has to do with the fact of, of, of measuring depth or binocularity, so the distance of an object from us. Um, and, you know, we, we have that, that, that strength secondary to overlap between the two eyes. Now, there are some monocular cues or single eye cues that we can actually um, end up uh, taking advantage of. But primarily, this is done by having great overlap between the two eyes. Now, you can see in a human having these front-facing eyes, or in a big cat like a tiger or a lion, having these front-facing eyes, I have a lot of overlap, which you can see visualized in this schematic in green for the human. And that allows me to really precisely understand depth or range. But um, when I have front-facing eyes, I severely limit my field of view. So my field of view in yellow here is about 180 degrees. If I compare and contrast that to the duck, the duck has much more laterally placed eyes. And so I minimize my overlap, which means if you actually ask the duck how far things were from the duck and the duck were to be conversant with you in English, it, it probably wouldn't do a great job at understanding how far objects were from you. But they would do a good job in understanding if there were threats there because of its extremely wide field of view. So understanding kind of X and Y um, if you were in a Cartesian plane. And so because of that lateral placement, they have these really sweeping views of the surrounding uh, of its surrounding environment for situational awareness. So oftentimes, if you try and come up behind a duck to appreciate its beauty, it, it, it immediately notices um, that you're coming up from behind it and kind of scurries away um, secondary to its field of view. But, you know, what's interesting about all of this is if we think about that in biology has different examples and usually one comes at the sacrifice of the other. Synthetically, as it relates to the driverless car projects, and there are over 200 different makes and manufacturers that have now driverless car divisions, we could do we could do both simultaneously. You know, now living in the fourth industrial revolution, we don't have to have to sacrifice one at the at the expense of the other. Um, so, you know, we can create these amazing 360 degree field of view and have, you know, amazing uh, depth perception, um, you know, through different, um, in this situation, what are called advanced driver assist systems for these driverless car projects. But we've been, what we've been very interested in, um, in, a, in our lab for, for a number of years has been, you know, what do these technologies mean as they become cheaper and more miniaturized for the pedestrian or the end user as they walk through these urban landscapes? And if we try to understand um, what you can see here visualized on the right um, is these first and last mile challenges. So as I navigate from my domicile to a public transportation access point and then travel from that access point um, you know, to you know, the closest stop from, by school or by my place of employment, how do I then close that gap to get from that final, that final stop to my final destination? Means sitting in my chair at my place of occupation or at my, you know, school of higher learning, et cetera. Um, and so I wanted to take a pause now. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to interrupt um, and, uh, you know, throw me a question. But 
Um, I, I wanted to kind of do, do a, a, a little bit of a, um, of, of a background on some of the assistive technologies that are kind of out there within the field uh, for those who are more unfamiliar. So a lot of times people will ask, well, what kind of technologies currently exist within the assistive technology space if we were to take advantage of them? So I don't know, Beth, if um, um, there are any questions yet, but, but feel free to, uh, to, to interrupt me at any point in time. If not, nope, we're good. We're good. Nobody has one yet, but I'm sure they're coming. Okay, great. So, um, you know, so where are we with assistive tech? And, you know, I'm a kind of a simple guy. I, I like Occam's razor. So I like to, th you know, keep things, um, you know, uh, you know, at, at a basic level. So I like to think of things as cane tech, phone tech, and wearable tech. So if we think about, you know, cane based assistive technology, um, and I have some references in this section. So if, if anyone needs these, I'm happy to flip these over to you later. Um, you know, how can we actually improve upon the white cane? So the traditional white cane, you know, by and large, you know, the most well-known primary mobility tool. And so I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go through the pros and cons of the traditional white cane. Obviously, most people know it's got most widespread adoption, um, low cost, reliable, obviously very efficient, but you're very limited, obviously, um, given the length of the cane and arm extension in terms of your ultimate reach, right? Um, and then in terms of mid-body um, and um, head height level obstacles. Um, so, you know, what have people done in terms of technology-assisted white canes? Well, there are kind of three different ways to classify um, technology-assisted white canes. You could think of them as either electronic travel aids, so detecting obstacles through sensors. You could think of them as kind of orientation aids or providing assistance from getting uh, from, point B, from point A to point B or from point B to point A. So using kind of digital compasses or different compass devices. And then um, there is kind of another way to differentiate them based on what are considered position locator devices or PLDs um, using kind of a, a combination of GPS and other localization techniques. Um, and that area has really exploded um, in the last decade or two uh, with more advanced techniques. And, and we can talk a little bit more about that. So um, if you look at the right here, um, in this schematic, you know, where are the opportunities and, and, and what are some of the differentiating points between um, this tech aided um, white cane option? Um, so you can think a little bit about um, how you interact with the system in terms of input. So there are options to either have push buttons or switches on the actual cane itself. Some people have um, configured joysticks on the actual cane. Um, so leveraging the cane as a foundation and then building them on top. Um, uh, there's um, the consideration of sensor usage. Um, so, and I'll talk about this briefly um, on the next slide. People have adopted for kind of single sensors or multiple sensors. sensors. Um, you can think about the navigation environment you're in. You can think about the operation mode, functionality, computational devices, um, the sensor sensing range, um, the positioning of the sensory unit, um, and then some of the specific localization technology. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about single versus multiple sensors. Um, so. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but suffice it to say, if I'm going to marry a, a sensing technology, like a distance and ranging sensor, like an ultrasound to a cane, I have the option of keeping that a solitary unit versus using a plurality, a, a plurality of sensors, right? Um, and there are kind of pros and cons to this. And this is kind of a heavy slide. And, and again, we can make this available to you. Um, I, I don't have to belabor this point, but you can look at sensor fusion projects where you look at GPS versus um, ultrasound or RFID and different technologies that could be married to one another um, to improve the strength of the concept. Um, as it relates to the type of type of sensors, um, some other opportunities um, include uh, laser technologies, um, um, adding uh, different inertial sensors um, for, for what's called uh, dead reckoning in certain situations, depending on navigation. Uh, GPS, as, as some of us may have heard, does not work very well um, in urban canyons, um, um, uh, given a lot of um, uh, the tall buildings. Um, and we can talk more about that um, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, uh, pros and cons about using different cameras and GPS technologies or using near field communication or um, RFIDs. So again, kind of a, a lot of kind of heavy information, but I just wanted to kind of paint the background. Um, and then of course, um, we have the option from a computational device. So if I'm gonna adorn a cane with different sensing technologies. Um, I could either use a microcontroller, like we may have read about Arduinos. I could use the smartphone as a gateway technology to process um, and provide raw compute power uh, for my actual technology, or I can actually hook it up directly to a computer um, in a knapsack or a book bag um, with some type of either a tethered cable or in certain situations with some type of a, a wireless link, which is a little bit more, um, a little bit more challenging. Um, 
So some examples of these devices that we may have seen um, in the literature or potentially also talked about with some assistive technology professionals, um, things like the smart cane, uh, which you can see visualized on the lower left um, and on the, um, the kind of uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the mid panel on the, uh, the lower aspect of the screen. Um, there is a, 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 a device called the kinetic cane, which is a little larger in form factor. Um, and then also some of us may be uh, familiar with the mini guide, um, which, is, which is actually a cane free alternative. Um, now, you know, so, some of the difficulties um, with these technologies when you actually adorn a cane with, the, um, with this tech is that when you have this dynamic navigation technique, whether you're using constant contact um, or two point touch, is that that dynamic platform, as you have another kind of technology on top of it, becomes somewhat difficult because as we know, there's somewhat variability, there's some variability in, in how we move forward with our cane technique. And so those in inconsistencies create, um, you know, different learning curves. And, um, you know, it, it's oftentimes difficult for us to, um, you know, sometimes imbibe this information as we, as, as we create kind of an, an, a new path forward um, uh, with this device. So, um, you know, some of these are used in particular use cases. And I think, um, you know, depending on the need, they can perform quite well. Um, but sometimes in more dynamic environments, they could be very challenging given the variability in cane use and having some dynamic platforms. Um, some of the canes are recommended to, kept in, to, to be kept in a static posture, um, but, but that's more rare. And in most cases, you end up, you end up seeing them in a dynamic um, uh, mode of operation. So transitioning to the mobile-based assistive technology options, um, there are some, um, um, uh, some technologies um, that you may have heard about um, uh, called LookTel or Ariana. Um, LookTel, if you're unfamiliar, is a smartphone-based camera stream um, that takes the live video um, to a processing de desktop remotely to run object recognition. Um, it's kind of similar to a synthetic version of remote sighted assistance for kind of Ira.io or Be My Eyes, where you're using a neural net to provide the kind of the, the horsepower behind that operation. Um, so you are able to do some real-time object recognition. Um, the, the idea here is a user points the camera toward the object of interest, um, and then you're able to, um, you know, get that uh, navigation-related functional assistance. Um, Ariana is a bit of a different form factor that represents some other mobile-based technologies where you're adding additional infrastructural elements to your environment. So in this situation, it allows for indoor path planning navigation um, uh, by actually implementing um, uh, landmark-based information um, uh, uh, into, your, um, uh, into your environment. Um, so it, it requires these kind of uh, painted or kind of sticker-based um, uh, guidance systems on the actual floor. I'll show you a picture of that very shortly. Um, so here is you moving your phone uh, for object recognition, um, similar to some of the other apps you may have used, um, such as Seeing AI. Um, so here's LookTel on the left, and Ariana is on the right. So you can see this kind of yellow and blue stripe that's being recognized by the actual cell phone, um, and then that's being used as a foundation to provide some indoor navigation assistance. Um, so quickly transitioning into some different wearable assistive technologies. Um, and and by, you know, uh, um, by the way, these are uh, by, by no means comprehensive, it's just to kind of provide some type of a, of, of, of a background on the different alternatives. Um, uh, th th there are um, a host of wearables that you will see over the last 30 or 40 years in the literature um, I'm just going to provide a small swath of them here. Um, uh, you can see um, uh, here is what's known as the SWAN, uh, which is a system for wearable audio navigation. Um, it involves a small portable com computer, an audio processor, um, uh, audio presentation hardware in the form of uh, bone conduction headphones, um, a tactile input device, and then some position and orientation tracking technologies, um, all within a shoulder bag. Um, so on the lower right-hand side, um, you can actually see an end user carrying a knapsack that's carrying some of the related technologies. Um, and in the second schematic, there's actually a tactile input device where they can help control um, um, uh, the actual modes of operation um, uh, for this technology. Um, so um, I, I believe I have one more uh, picture of this. Um, and then um, a, a wearable device that was created by Ambutech, which is um, a, a big player uh, within the white cane space, uh, oops, sorry, are the eyeglasses, uh, which we may be familiar with. Um, uh, the eyeglasses are kind of a, a larger um, um, uh, eyeglass-based uh, frame um, that has an ultrasound sensor integrated um, into the actual uh, frame uh, itself. Uh, and then provi it provides um, uh, vibrations on the side of the forehead um, uh, in kind of a, an, an inversely correlated uh, relationship. So as you, um, 
uh, move closer to the actual object, the, the frequency of, of, of vibration scales. This is uh, very common, similar to kind of some uh, uh, parking, um, uh, uh, parking warning systems uh, in um, luxury cars these days when you get too close to the bumper in front of you with a little chirp scaling and frequency as you get closer. Um, uh, it's um, uh, obviously hands-free and can provide some assistance. Um, but, um, you know, some have, uh, in terms of uh, my experience, uh, it, it, some end users who've tried, uh, participants who've tried these devices, uh, find the vibration around the temporal bones, um, you know, somewhat uncomfortable after shorter, shorter periods of operation in terms of use. Um, one um, um, uh, other technology that we may uh, be much more familiar with that uh, perhaps um, uh, some of us are actually using on this call um, is uh, a blind square. Um, uh, blind square is a GPS app for navigation uh, and speech audio feedback. Um, so it can be used with different uh, headset technologies. Um, it has accurate indoor, um, out, out, outdoor navigation, excuse me, um, and um, uh, can provide some indoor navigation uh, with Bluetooth um, access points um, once these eye beacons uh, have been positioned um, uh, appropriately. You're, you're able to track some points of interest um, and um, uh, it does have um, off-the-shelf um, uh, um, uh, downloads uh, for both um, iPhones and iPads, which is um, a, a, nice, um, a nice advantage. Um, so uh, going back to the SWAN device, um, here is um, a, a little bit of how this virtual reality-based kind of soundscape system works, um, where you're able to kind of uh, recapitulate some of the environment or different cues um, into this um, two-dimensional information, um, uh, which is done through spatialized audio. Um, so um, uh, you're able to uh, basically um, uh, hear um, based on a, kind of almost a Marco Polo concept with these scaling chirps, um, uh, you know, um, uh, set to the scheme, uh, whether or not you're becoming uh, closer to different landmarks. Um, and while this was originally conceived of, um, you know, primarily operating initially within two dimensions in X and Y, as you can see this um, end user trying to hit a target um, uh, in virtual space, um, through this um, spatialized audio, they are now adding depth um, as well to this project. Um, so um, a couple of other uh, last examples here um, before we transition. Um, there is the remote guidance system um, uh, that you can see visualized on the lower left here, uh, which is a combination between digital cameras, uh, GPS uh, processing units and headsets, um, and also the Percept system, which is a, a bit of a different um, opportunity um, where you see um, uh, a kind of a, a handheld-based um, uh, RFID reader um, uh, that comes with an antenna and some rechargeable batteries um, and can provide um, uh, information depending on uh, where in the, in, in the environment you have these, um, um, these tags. Um, so um, I think um, I'll probably uh, move into a quick summary slide. Let me see how I'm doing on time. Well, as you're doing that, I'm going to just give you some encouragement. So from Brent, who comes to all yeah. of our webinars. Hello, Brent. Yes. Um, he says, this is the best, in capital letters, detailed summary of assistive technology that I have witnessed to date. The fact that <laughs> Doc Rizzo, well, that's another one I can use now, Doc Rizzo, is a CHMer makes it even more applicable. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. There's much more here. This is just to kind of give you a brief overview, and I apologize if, if this is too much detail, but I just wanted to give you, you know, some breakdown in cane tech, phone tech, and wearable tech, um, and, you know, go over, um, you know, some summary information uh, before we go into some of what we're working on personally. So I, I really thank you for that, and, and by all means, keep them coming, because um, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll, 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 I'll get a couple of, uh, what do we call the opposite of compliments from my wife uh, later on for things I didn't <laughs> do this morning. So um, any compliments I'll take, suffice it to say. <laughs> well, you know, uh, here's just another quick thought as, as you're progressing into your slide presentation is, you know, you, you are presenting a lot of information, a lot of data very quickly. And I think uh, for many of us, we're trying to, to digest it, right? So as you are thinking about, or if you could incorporate, um, you know, for people who have moderate to severe vision loss, and maybe you'll get into this in a few minutes, which um, devices would you recommend? And maybe talking just a little bit more slowly about those aspects, um, if that okay. makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, it, it, um, I, I'll, I will try and um, add those details. Um, I think in certain situations, it depends on understanding a little bit more about the particulars um, of the present situation. You know, one of the interesting things here is I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in creating a much larger suite of, of products that can increase functionality, but to try and be more comprehensive in how we create some of these solutions, um, you know, in that if we can understand more about residual division, where we are in terms of our current um, you know, uh, functionality, then I think we can really try and marry the correct device or app with, you know, your current user needs. Um, so um, I'm happy to kind of have some sideline conversations about how we can try and fit um, different um, uh, different apps or different recommendations. And, you know, if, uh, if the apps are of interest, we can perhaps double back and um, even talk more about some, uh, some free apps or some apps that are kind of lower cost, um, uh, you know, to help meet, uh, you know, particular need. Um, I think there's a lot out there, and what's exciting is now that we're in the, this kind of fourth industrial revolution um, or the age of IoT, um, you know, we're going to see more within this digital innovation pipeline, which is exciting. Um, I think we need to kind of move towards um, some of these more um, uh, comprehensive platforms, and, and I'll speak to that shortly. Um, so, but, but, but really good question. Um, so, um, any other um, chat questions before I move on, Beth? Nope, that's it. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, so you know, in summary, we have these kind of these these this cane tech, this this kind of uh, phone tech, and then we have this kind of wearable tech. And you know, obviously, there are pros and cons to everything, and um, you know, everyone's going to have their own particular preferences. And obviously, I, I highly recommend working with our orientation and mobility partners on this. I mean, they're extremely worldly on on all of this information, and it's important to both work with either uh, obviously your local foundation and also. Um, you know, O&Ms um, uh, in your area, whether it's the Lighthouse Guild or some other organization um, to try and get the right information, um, you know, but at the end of the day, um, you know, how can we break, um, you know, some of this technology down from a, uh, for, you know, from a summary standpoint. So, um, you know, obviously cane-based ETAs are great. Um, you know, we're very familiar with, with, with canes oftentimes. So, so building them and using them as a scaffold is very easy. Um, you know, a lot of them can be operated with one hand, uh, you know, particularly the ones that take um, either single or multiple sensors, a plurality of sensors, and, and put them on kind of a cane platform, assuming the weight can be controlled. Um, you know, that, that's often very helpful. Um, you know, but in certain situations, uh, the obstacle detection and, and some of the actual benefits are somewhat limited. Um, and as I talked about before, um, a lot of the ones that um, the need to maintain that constant contact or that two-point touch technique it becomes very difficult to kind of learn that additional sensory information as an input modality on top of the additional cane information. So sometimes it's a lot, I think it's, it's overwhelming in those dynamic environments. Um, and, you know, these are some conversations we've had with, with O&Ms that we collaborate with. Um, on the smartphone based technology, I think it's great. I mean, cell phones are pervasive. Um, I think, you know, it, there's some recent surveys have said 70 to 80% of, you know, the visual impairment space now has a smartphone, which is just fantastic. So, we have to be using more smartphone-based applications. There's a lot of social acceptability, obviously less stigma. We, we, we use the same exact devices. We just try to change the accessibility settings, which is fantastic. And as we move towards more kind of current generations of cell phones, although they are now coming in certain cases at extreme costs <laughs> with some of these new cell phones over $1,200 each, um, you know, having you know, better GPS sensors or GNSS sensors, um, even LiDAR systems and stereo cameras, um, it just really, um, advantageous for us to think about how we can leverage that hardware. Um, you know, some of the difficulty um, um, with the cell phone are the ergonomics, um, and we'll try and address that as well. So, you know, the, 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 the need to use the cell phone, particularly when you're navigating or for wayfinding, when also using a cane as a primary mobility tool, tying up both of your hands, trying to use the limited field of view of the camera to catch sight of that device. As you saw in that locale technology, I'm trying to catch sight of a particular object of interest, and so now it becomes, um, you know, um, uh, the, the onus is on me to try and get the appropriate field of view for the camera of that object of interest, right? So I can then do the processing on the back end. Um, and, you know, I, I think the idea here is in certain situations that can become difficult um, and maybe in certain situations harrowing if I'm in a dynamic navigation task. Um, you know, I'm in New York City, right? So if I'm on Fifth Avenue and Fourth Street, this rush hour, I have my cane out. It's just starting to get dark out, which is one of my most difficult times. And I'm trying to do the best I can. There are people honking their horns. There's a homeless guy who's kind of yelling obscenities behind me. 
Um, there's a lot going on from a cognitive load standpoint, let alone using my white cane plus a cell phone that I now have to kind of move around or sweep in terms of field of view to make sure that I can capture the right object that can then be processed on a, a computer um, remotely, right? So, you know, some food for thought. Um, and then, you know, the wearables um, have a lot of upside in that they can be designed for various functions, assuming they can be done correctly. There's some wearables that are very, um, you know, conspicuous and those that are inconspicuous. So um, I, I think there, there's a big opportunity and we'll talk about that more shortly. Um, but, you know, we have to be careful because where is that, you know, that, that kind of fine line? Um, and can we engineer some devices, um, um, you know, that, that, that really do, um, you know, look, um, uh, you know, quite uh, streamlined in profile? Um, almost like they were kind of a, an everyday regular device, but at the same point have some powerful sensors hidden, um, you know, behind the scenes, if you will. Um, but we have to be mindful of, you know, weight um, and the computational power and what's involved in terms of battery and power constraints. Um, and then wireless, and then of course, um, uh, you know, cybersecurity. So, you know, there are some, you know, considerations that we have to be mindful of on the con side, but I think those are some considerations that we can negotiate. So, I'm going to um, uh, pause there um, and then um, I was gonna talk very briefly about GPS because I know people talk a, a lot about GPS tools and then I'm gonna kind of launch into some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, so unless there are any other questions, I'll-, I'll There keep... is, there's a question from Brent. Um, do some of these technologies negate the need for guide dogs or are they intended to complement having a guide dog? Um, I myself have no dog, but I imagine some attendees may be wondering about that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I can tell you that in certain situations, you know, some of the cane based technologies would assume the fact that you wouldn't have a guide dog and that some of the applications have found it difficult to work with a guide dog because the guide dog is going to be trained with a specific kind of, um, you know, set of behavioral um, um, uh, 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 structures and strategies in mind during the particular environment um, and tasks or, you know, commands per the owner. Um, and, and sometimes that can be at a crossroads with um, what the device ultimately wants to do. So I know in, in certain situations, um, it can be difficult. So um, I think you bring up a really good point in that um, uh, the compatibility uh, between some of these systems and guide dog use is something that really needs to be um, studied carefully. Um, and in certain situations, um, I actually think modes of operation need to be, um, you know, thought of that would be, um, you know, aside from, you know, sedentary tasks, right? I mean, if you're sitting down at a table and you're not using your guide dog, of course, but during dynamic navigation tasks, if you're going to be using some of these devices um, that could, you know, cause you to have an interrupted walking pattern or could cause you to do different things during walking, um, I think it is something to be very mindful of. And it does speak to the fact that we would probably need to create um, unique modes of operation if they were to be used to augment um, the capabilities while using a dog in parallel or concurrently. Um, so hopefully that helps answer that question. Anything else, Beth? Nope, not right now. Right. Actually, yes. Oop, hold oh. the phone. Yep, we do. Eric sent a couple questions. Um, I am an, okay, I'm going to maybe mispronounce this. Ira, A-I-R-A. Uh -huh. I'm an Ira user. Um, yeah. It can be a bit, I am a bit apprehensive in using the iPhone. So urban, in, sorry, there's some typing things here. In using the iPhone in so, so urban settings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so I, I think I understand the question. So um, uh, uh, thanks, Eric, for the question. So yeah, the um, you know the remote side of the systems, whether it's either Ira or Be My Eyes, um, yeah, there are certainly some considerations using them in urban settings. I mean, um, you know, uh, uh, Be My Eyes, for example, doesn't want to get involved in street crossing. So in certain situations, you can have some access to information through the remote guide. In other situations, that that access will be turned off. I mean, I know depending on the vantage points that you're trying to gain. Um, you know, the end use, the, um, the remote sighted um, uh, uh, guide is, is, is only going to have the vantage point that you can afford that individual through the camera, right? And so it, it involves interaction with the actual end user um, or the participant. And so, you know, sometimes in certain situations that can be very challenging. Um, and then it depends on having a strong uh, cell phone connection. So I know of some um, and you know individuals who've struggled because in city environments with the urban canyon effect, tall building tall buildings are going to block satellite connectivity, and you're going to have issues. Um, and so it ends up happening is you get interrupted uh, issues and um, uh, interruptions in your um, uh, in that communication, um, and that can also be challenging. Um, so are there situations where 
there could be basic and advanced modes of operation where your device can pr can provide some level of support, but meaning w without uh, locally on the device um, uh, itself. But then in situations where you have high bandwidth, can you be aware of that and provide more advanced functionality? We'll actually talk about some of that with our wearables. And that's actually, I think, where the field should go. So hopefully that'll help answer some of your questions. And, and John, will it be possible to share these slides with our attendees so that it can take a look at these at their own time? Sure. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. So um, before I jump into some of our, um, our concepts, I, I just wanted to pause on GPS. I mean, GPS is thrown around a lot. Um, some may be familiar with Microsoft's Landmark AI, um, which was kind of a GPS-based uh, uh, localization um, technique. Um, the um, you know the the issue with with GPS primarily in in those who live in in, in urban areas is that um, you're going to end up having a, a lot of issues, uh, particularly with this um, this one study and the references here um, by Saha et al. Um, is that you're going to have lots of issues with false positives in terms of where you're trying to localize the people or the landmarks that you're um, you know currently um, closest to in terms of proximity, um, and you know a lot of this comes down to this the positional error secondary to um, appreciating the building geometry and satellite visibility. So, you know, if, if you look at where satellites are um, and, you know, where you are in, in kind of a very crowded, um, meaning a three-dimensional crowded space in, in different urban landscapes, it becomes very difficult um, to understand what that means for your cell signal um, or the, the, the actual satellite signal or what's called ephemeris. Um, so, you know, those signals are kind of bouncing around and they can bounce around the actual buildings itself. And so when you have what's called non-line of sight, meaning you don't have a direct shot to that satellite, um, that signal is going to bounce around a lot. And so what I have visualized here is as much as five meters plus or minus of error in either direction. So you and, and I think these numbers are actually pretty, pretty kind for the GPS space. So, you know, you can have as much as 15, 20 feet. In, in, and, and again, much more depending on the technique um, and where you are of error positionally. And, and you could see this you know, quite plainly and even hailing an Uber or um, a Lyft or one of these new um, you know, kind of uh, uh, car hailing services and seeing where your car is in space and how it's jumping back and forth between blocks. I mean, these aren't small changes. These are pretty big changes. And in terms of trying to figure out what store you need to go to, or those kind of last few meters um, challenge, this becomes a big uh, a big issue in, in localization. And we'll also address that. So I'm gonna segue into um, what we've been focusing on. And so um, I told you wearables have a lot of opportunity. So can we build an inconspicuous form, uh, you know, a form factor um, and, you know, th that, that can, you know, perform quite well um, and, and that could look, you know, really like um, uh, almost a regular device. Can we build that kind of synthetic compound eye of the dragonfly, if you will, with 30,000 facets? And what I have visualized here is what we like to consider a sensory augmentative tool or a smart surface system that can build spatial intelligence and provide onboard navigation. And so you're seeing some of our earlier prototypes. Um, and these basically involve using unique housings that we've built directly onto book bags, hiking book bags. And we have these very powerful stereoscopic cameras that are only a couple inches by a couple inches. Um, um, so, you know, in one dimension um, and um, a, about um, a half of an inch in depth. Um, so they're very lightweight. Uh, we build them into these kind of black uh, um, uh, scaffolding um, uh, that kind of clips right onto a shoulder strap of a book bag. Um, and, you know, when it's black on black, you barely even notice that you're wearing this camera technology. And you can kind of walk around and we have these high definition video streams of the um, surrounding environment. And what's neat is we built a number of different um, mounting systems. So we can put these on thermal straps, book bag straps. We're currently looking at different facets, the ways to kind of build these camera systems into the shoulder straps and thermal straps of the book bag itself. And we've actually now adorned the inside of the book bag. So if you take a hiking book bag and you look at the inside, We've now built actuators into the waist straps and into the back, and we're trying to build them into the back of the shoulder straps so we can build what are called haptic feedback devices into the actual knapsack itself. So we can actually give you vibratory feedback of what was happening in the immediate environment. So for kind of a bystander or your family friend, it would look kind of like a normal book bag. Maybe if you looked really, really closely, you'd kind of see some of these camera lenses. But for you, it's just kind of really powerful instrumented book bag that can provide um, really neat video streaming opportunities for us to do all types of machine learning and artificial intelligence so we can provide on-demand spatial intelligence to you um, through different microservices. Um, and so 
Um, I have kind of some avatars showing different sensor fusion concepts on the, on the middle aspect. Um, so we've, we've looked at different ultrasound and, and LIDAR technologies built into either both vests and also book bags. Um, right now, we're primarily using book bags. Um, you can see some CAD files or some, some computer-aided drawings here um, where we're showing this. And, and um, uh, the way this basically works um, is that from the vibratory feedback standpoint, we have a number of different modes of operation. We can interact um, um, with you through touch or through audio messages. So we have these uh, binaural bone conduction headsets, um, which I'll show you here. Um, so there's a headset that kind of clips in, in the ear. Um, we have these sensor systems, these, these kind of stereo cameras, and sometimes um, we use thermal imaging cameras, these very, very small thermal imaging cameras that we build into the straps. We have these microcontrollers that we can throw directly into the book bag. Um, and then we have these feedback devices, both um, binaural bone conduction headsets that I mentioned. Um, we, we use um, Aftershocks um, uh, units primarily, which you, you may have heard about. If not, I can tell you a little bit more about, about them. And then we have these kind of vibratory actuators, almost the same, um, uh, similar to what you have in your cell phone to provide kind of a silent buzzing um, if you're in a meeting and don't want to have a chirp alert, um, but um, with a much superior what's called actuation authority. So we can have much better control over them. Um, and so what this allows us to do is what's called a human in the loop um, um, navigation assistance in complex urban environments. And so um, uh, you can see here um, on the right, um, we have um, one of our kind of more sophisticated um, uh, book bags um, that's actually uh, providing mapping for one of our projects. And we have cameras positioned both on the back and front of the book bag. Um, and so um, what I'll do now is I'm going to transition into um, the types of um, uh, functionality that we've built into the book bag, given the fact that we now have this kind of cool um, insight or this kind of compound eye that we built synthetically, if you will. What could we now do with this information? So I'll tell you a little bit about now about what we're, what we're doing with this information. Um, any questions at this point, Beth? Pause or? Nope, we're good. We're good. Okay. So now that I have this kind of book bag that has these, these cameras you can potentially throw on, what type of services could I provide for you? Well, <clears throat> one of the biggest ones, obviously, with the GPS apps is, is localization. And we talked a little bit about different apps and GPS apps and getting from point A to point B. So one of our projects that we've been trying to work on for a while has been um, what we call vision place recognition. So the idea here is <clears throat> if you navigate through a specific area, uh, let's say a city park, um, and then, you know, this is one of your favorite city parks where you like to have coffee and Danish in the mornings, um, and then you go back into that city park, um, you know, can we, can we start to develop um, a, a mapping database of that area and the surrounding areas? So when you walk through that area or you need to get through that area to get to other points of interest, can we then provide um, spatial intelligence to navigate through, um, you know, that specific area? So the way this basically works here um, is there's a mapping sequence um, and then there's basically a localization sequence. And I don't want to go into too many specifics, but we basically use some, uh, some little computer vision tricks um, and we remove um, on the top in blue, we basically take a whole bunch of kind of images from, we take the video stream, we separate it into frames and then we remove all the dynamic objects and we keep all of the kind of the static objects, the buildings and the trees, uh, but all of the kind of dynamic things that wouldn't be there on a day by day basis are removed. And we build what are called these topometric maps. And we overlay this with GPS reference information from uh, open, open, um, from open resources um, like uh, Google, for example. Um, and then what we do is when you're then, when you then go back into that space, we take that the same images from the from the actual cameras on the book bag, and we do what's called semantic edge recognition. So as you can see in pink on the bottom here, I don't know if you can see my cursor. There is basically um, um, a, an imprint of all the edges from the picture streaming in through the video. So uh, I can take one of the cameras and I can pull an image and I can extract all the edges as if I was doing a line drawing. And then I can match those line drawings to this mapping database. So this is called vision place recognition. And what's really cool is this gets really good. And with artificial intelligence, I can actually start to reconstruct roughly the three-dimensional environment. So what you can see on the right here is us reconstructing an intersection that we've then walked through. So, you know, the way this could potentially walk, you know, work is, I'm interested in going from, uh, you know, uh, point one here on this map to point five. 
Um, and so, you know, the user sets a destination subway station. Um, um, we actually have a project where we've built a little wristband that can provide some additional um, uh, haptic feedback as well. Um, and we can prompt uh, the end user through either the belt or these little bracelets with some audio information about how to turn with exactly how many strides that you would need to take, uh, you know, point by point. Um, but, you know, the, the precision of this information is approximately within, you know, one to two feet of accuracy. And we're able to understand orientation with about five degrees of error, as opposed to some of the other, uh, other systems which aren't, are unable to give any orientation information um, and with much um, more um, inaccuracy. Um, and so you can, you know, get from and na navigate from, um, uh, from point A uh, to point B. Um, so um, to make this real for you, um, I have a couple of videos here. Um, so um, here's some preliminary work. Um, so this is actually a pilot that we did with the Department of Transportation in New York City. Um, and I don't know if you can see here um, in this, and if you can't, <clears throat> I apologize, I'll do my best to describe it. But if I do an insufficient job, please let me know and I will re-describe it. Um, we have four different panels here. On the um, upper left, we have an incoming image from the actual camera itself, which is known as a query image. Um, and on the, on the, the, the lower left-hand panel, we have what's known as a returned image or our match, matched image based on the database that we've just created. So someone was just navigating through this space. We were able to build um, um, uh, a map of this. We have a query image, meaning I'm sampling the database and I'm trying to return a match back to it to see if within my database I can find a fit based on my artificial intelligence. And um, what I'm then able to do is um, you can see I'm actually matching very well. Um, and so uh, on the right-hand panels, I have an, an aerial view of the actual intersection in downtown Brooklyn, where we did this um, experiment in near the engineering school, which is actually Willoughby and Bridge Street, for anyone who knows downtown Brooklyn. And you can actually see how accurately there's a little red arrow where we can localize the end user as they're navigating through um, the intersection, going north to south, um, uh, uh, east to west, and then going across each of the, um, the curb cuts and across each of those streets. And you can actually see in terms of the red arrows um, and a little bit of the blue trajectory, we're actually doing really well um, um, showing you that the end user is primarily staying within the zebra stripes or the continental stripes um, in terms of the accuracy of the system. Um, what we've also done to show um, whether or not this system uh, can perform indoors versus outdoors, because a lot of these GPS systems can only perform usually in one environment, without any, any type of infrastructure um, is that we wanted to see if we could get it to work uh, within an indoor-based setting. Um, and so what's nice about this is even if you lose cell signal, what you can do is you can download the database that you would need of that specific environment ahead of time. So you can imagine you could walk into a new grocery store. Um, there could be um, a little kiosk and that information could be downloaded directly to your phone or to your device. And then immediately you have all of the information you would need in order to localize you within that environment. And so what we have here is we have a little camera system that was built into a shopping cart um, that actually has a little motor connected to it. Um, and here is um, a, a research participant. Um, and uh, she was interested in, in, in getting some help shopping. The shopping was very problematic for her and took a long time. So um, she said, you know, could you help me navigate to the fruit section and get some bananas? And so what I'll play for you here is um, uh, you can see it's just starting. She's saying, you know, take me to the bananas. Um, she wants to buy some fruit. Um, and um, the, the, the cart is actually moving around other carts. So it has uh, obstacle negotiation. And then it's taking her into the fruit section because we knew where the fruit was. So this shopping cart is actually pulling her in the direction of interest per her guidance as she's interacting with that device, that handheld device, um, and is now taking her to the fruit section, as you can see. Um, so she's now approaching the fruit section. Again, please, if I'm not describing this correctly, please let me know, um, or I'm doing an insufficient job with auditory description. Um, and so now um, you can see her in the, um, uh, in the fruit section. I actually do have uh, audio for this. Um, and so you can see her, there's bananas right there. She just went by the bananas um, and she's actually now asking about prices. Um, and so you can actually see that this mapping um, and this robotic controlled uh, device with the uh, vision place recognition 
uh, uh, was actually uh, sufficient uh, for her to get to the bananas safely. Um, so the way this basically works is we have a neural net that is able to then localize you within that mapping database as I talked uh, about. And so uh, when we do that, um, I showed you on the intersection in downtown Brooklyn on Willoughby and Bridge, we can then place you in your environment. And so we can take those images, which are called um, frustins, and we can actually build them together and, and, and piece together your trajectory, uh, which is very useful for a number of reasons. Um, so we've done some compare and contrast between different, um, our, um, basically different machine learning techniques about how do you, uh, which best vision uh, place recognition technique um, um, is, is optimal. Um, given the type of research that we're doing. And here you can actually see um, in the middle panels um, some different opportunities, um, some, some different uh, pipelines. Uh, so we have a query image again on the upper left. And now on the upper right, the lower left and the lower right, we have three return images using three different techniques in that mapping database. And you can see on the upper right is a score called a RANSAC score. And if you're insufficient in that score, which means it's low, um, you actually, it, it, it turns red. So the one on the upper right did not perform very well with known as net VLAD. The technique that we're using most is called lock net in blue, and you can actually see it performed quite well. And the return image almost matches identically the query image, meaning in the areas that we've already mapped uh, in that mapping database, we can return exactly where you were in space. And if you look to the far right, we can then position you precisely on the map. Uh, so the red and the blue did a really nice job positioning where you were on the sidewalk, whereas the green technique did not do as well. Um, and what's cool about this is we tested it both in New York City and in Korea. Um, and you can see this, um, that regardless of uh, geographic location, um, we can do quite well. Um, and we've been able to reconstruct uh, path planning. So you can see in, in, in panel A, um, which is on your extreme left, um, we've been able to reconstruct this path uh, from um, one of our graduate students walking around um, this environment. And then on the lower um, panel B, you can actually see this is actually an area in Korea uh, where one of our incoming graduate students that I was co-advising with um, a roboticist was um, um, navigating near her apartment. Um, uh, so um, some pretty neat, pretty neat work. Now, now, one thing that we're doing is we're also trying to take advantage of other data that's already been um, sourced. Um, and so there are a lot of these mapping projects, you know, that kind of the Google, the, the Google cars, if you will, that are walking around with LiDAR systems and all these cameras, and they're constantly mapping the environment and trying to improve Google Maps. Um, we're working with a company called Carmera um, that has um, a lot of uh, uh, data already um, acquired. Um, so they've given us a year's worth of data or 200,000 images, and we've now benchmarked that data with some of the existing vision place recognition um, approaches. Um, and um, uh, we have a, a paper talking about some of those specifics, and I'm not going to talk too much about that unless there are any specific questions. So, you know, that may be cool. We have some of this localization stuff, but, you know, um, what actually happens when you're crossing the street? Intersection geometry is very important. Some of the apps, like we talked about, um, actually don't want to get involved because of the liability with um, street crossings, which have been a concern and raised um, to us. So we've decided that we need to um, uh, try and uh, combat some of these problems. Um, and in New York City, for example, uh, the DOT has um, well under 1,000 of their 15,000 signalized intersections accessible through APS technology, meaning they either have vibratory arrows or they have audible chirps. <clears throat> and so um, we decided um, uh, that uh, we, we, we thought we, we could uh, drastically accelerate um, uh, the plan to uh, make those accessible. Right now, they're doing 150 intersections per year. Um, and, um, you know, they have, I don't know, something like 14,000 intersections left to, um, to make accessible. Um, so they have decades of work ahead of them. Um, and uh, what we decided to do was to use a neural net that we trained on specifically the pedestrian signal. So that red hand or the white walking man. And so here you can see uh, what we call the cross safe program, um, uh, recognizing this through computer vision. Um, and with about, <clears throat> um, we have this up to 98 or 99% accuracy. I think at the time of the paper, it was a little bit lower that I reference here. Um, uh, we're able to identify the actual red or green pedestrian signal and provide that with a cue. Um, and so what I have here in this video is a quad view of um, one of our um, 
uh, interns wearing a book bag. On the upper left-hand panel, you can see the view from the book bag. On the upper right panel, you can actually see us providing a mask of all the objects of interest in that potential scene. So we can label cars, pedestrians, all kinds of interesting things. And what's really cool, which hadn't been done before, is we're actually going to start labeling the pedestrian signals, which you'll see coming up in a second uh, in the street crossing. On the bottom left, um, this is what's called a depth map. So I talked before about the, the disparity between um, the two human eyes front facing. And because we have these stereo cameras, we have two cameras and we can do disparity mapping as well. So this is how we determine the distance, how far you're from an object of interest. And then the bottom right hand view is what's known as our chaperone view. So we're keeping an eye on the intern or the research participants um, or the visually impaired end user as they navigate. Um, and so I hope you're able to see um, the crossing signal um, colored in red with a little code and actually the distance of that crossing signal from the end user um, in that video clip. Um, I don't know, maybe I should pause quickly. I've been uh, going for a while. Any other, <laughs> any other questions pop up, Beth? Yep. Again, from Brent says, do your research participants like the one at the Brooklyn Target have vision loss or are they sighted and trying to replicate someone who is visually blind? And then he shared, has this also been tested at Sahadi's, Brooklyn Heights former resident here? Smiley face. <laughs> um, it, it, it has not, um, to answer your latter question first. Um, <clears throat> and to answer your first question, um, We've done a bunch of testing, which has included um, kind of healthy participants, just interns to kind of get the system up and running. And then we've in certain situations simulated vision loss with different forms of blindfolding, et cetera. And then we've also have, depending on the experiment, run um, some um, participants uh, with uh, uh, visual impairment through uh, some of our work as well. Um, you know, I'll show at the end of this, you know, this is uh, uh, it's taken about 10 years, and I'm, I'm, I'm only showing you kind of a couple of snippets here of the different collaborations, the different projects, but this is really a, a team effort between um, about seven or eight um, really robust collaborations between different engineering disciplines and, you know, really fantastic collaborators. Um, and so a lot of them are at different stages of maturation, but we're really uh, laser focused on trying to make sure we can develop these microservices that could be used as part of um, either lighter modes of operation and cell phone applications for kind of uh, mobile tech, um, or also um, as part of a much more comprehensive wearable platform. Um, so um, a little bit of everything, um, but you know, a lot of this is still um, early days. Um, we're just trying to make sure that we have a really strong foundation. And towards the end of this, I'll show you a little bit more about what we're doing foundationally, which I think will be really, um, really important for how we take next steps um, on creating solutions that can be um, uh, uh, you know, uh, very powerful, um, uh, you know, for um, uh, providing, um, uh, I think, what I think will be uh, hopefully game-changing solutions. Hope that answers the question. Yep, and I have some other ones, um, but they're more generally speaking. So if you want to keep going, I, I'll ask at the end. Sure, and I realize that I'm kind of at an hour already, so I'll, I'll try and go, maybe I'll, I'll try and cut a couple of things up and we could always do another round. Um, so, um, this, That's I just want to, we were, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. That was one thing I was going to say here as a couple people, um, Kathy and Neil have suggested, you know, we have done four webinars earlier, maybe at the end uh -huh. of summer, beginning of fall on adaptive, um, technology. Um, we have four different ones and people can certainly look, his name was Nick Peterson, but we can, um, this is a great a really great inform, in, informative webinar with a lot of information. And as your time permits and as our inquiries come in, we can divide them out maybe into specific um, webinars down the line, you know, this winter um, to give get people more information as well. Sure. Sounds good. Um, <clears throat> sure. Um, so, uh, one of the other things we're very interested in doing is not just giving you the information as it relates to the pedestrian signal, but also understanding the intersection geometry as it relates to the zebra stripes or the continental stripes. Um, so are you walking um, where we're supposed to be walking um, in, in terms of, um, you know, what's marked as a pedestrian crossway? Um, and so we're trying to create these kind of lighter neural nets that can identify the continental stripes 
um, and that we can then also determine midline and whether or not you're staying closer to midline or veering away from midline with feedback. And so here is what we call cross safe part two, which is, and you can see on the right, on the upper panel, um, a number of different crosswalks from uh, different uh, camera images or video streams from the book bag in New York City. And on the bottom right, you can actually see a, kind of a zoomed up or a magged version of um, one of the, uh, the images from the book bag. And you can see us outlining the zebra stripe and then also creating a midline. And then once we have that, we can um, uh, understand um, a bit about ego motion or your motion in that zebra stripe and whether or not you're varying or veering off of that midline. And then we can give you some corrective um, feedback through both vibratory or audio um, information, which is important, obviously, because you, you, ne you would never want to veer um, into or towards the oncoming traffic, which unfortunately can sometimes happen. As we know, we get a little bit disoriented in the, um, uh, in the actual crosswalk itself. Um, and here's a little bit of, this is a confusion matrix showing a little bit about um, uh, how well we're doing in terms of true positives and, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 false positives, et cetera. Um, so um, a couple of things that I'll just mention in terms of gesture control, um, which are a little bit different than what you'll see in terms of some of the current commercial offerings. Um, we have a, another um, uh, microservice that we uh, use for exploration. We call this kind of service point to tell. Um, so, you know, some people um, use gesture to interact with the device itself, computer vision that works. The problem is in certain situations, the idea here is there's residual vision or can you actually point to something of interest or there's something slightly out of focus and can you get your finger to that point of interest so then the system can identify it or kind of read uh, the characters to perform some OCR. And we wanted to take one step back. We wanted to say, what if you could point wherever you wanted in your space, a kind of um, almost like a, a spotlight um, and turn your finger into a laser pointer. And then, you know, you want it to go to the left or you want it to go slightly to the left or wherever you want it to point, you know your proprioception. So you're connected to your joint position sense and you know where you're pointing to. And then we'll process the entire background scene and we'll tell you exactly what you're pointing to. So you can move your hand anywhere in the environment like a digital laser pointer, and we'll just start telling you what's in front of you, almost like a magic wand. Um, so we call this point to tell. <clears throat> and so uh, this is one of our research participants in the engineering library. Um, and he's wearing the book bag and he's sweeping his finger from left to right. And what you're seeing here is we're identifying the computer monitors, um, the table and the chairs as he's moving around. So if he was new to this library, he would then get some information about where different things are in that space without having to ask for any help. So he's bringing information to him on his own terms whenever he wants without needing the assistance of anyone else. Um, and that's kind of how we envision the system is kind of an exploration system where you can learn the system on demand um, um, at free will. Um, and so here's a feedback loop about how this works and how we're connecting kind of proprioception with the auditory feedback to objects of interest. Um, and so the neat thing about this is once we have this information, given the fact that we have strong um, uh, uh, depth information and we can understand finger pose, we can then take this one step further. So um, we have an exploration part two where um, if you're pointing around and you're pointing in a particular area of interest and then you know, we tell you, oh, you know, there's, your, there's the door handle to the door and you wanna move into the next room, <clears throat> you then want to get to that door, you want to grab that door, you can then perform either a circle or an X and make some type of a micro gesture. And then since you know the, you know the direction, given the fact that you're pointing at it, the only thing you're missing is the extent. You don't know how far you have to reach. Um, what we can do is we can give you that given the fact that we have the depth mapping. So we can easily say, you know, it's 2.5 feet away or it's, you know, a certain amount of inches away, depending on your preference. Um, and then what's cool about this is as that reach is unfolding, if you're reaching for the door handle, as you can see visualized on the right, if you start to drift, you know, normal you know, humans who have um, uh, normal sight perception, um, they have online reach feedback. So if I start to reach a little bit to the, to the right of a water bottle, I'm going to course correct and then move to the left. Um, if I'm visually impaired and my residual vision is I'm unable to kind of have that online feedback, um, I can do that synthetically. So the idea here is we're going to monitor your hand pose and what's known as the idealized trajectory. So where you want to go. And if you're drifting off that trajectory, we're going to give you feedback in the direction you need to correct. 
So meaning you should have kind of normal feedback corrective mechanisms through this system. Uh, and the way that's delivered is through a little bracelet that has um, uh, um, little vibration units on the top, bottom, left, and right. So if you need to vibrate a little, if you need to move a little bit to the left, you'll get vibration on the left. If you need to move a little bit to the right. So we're going to kind of push you or vibrate a little bit in the direction of travel. And this could be used at different scales, right? You could use it for reaching. If you're exploring and you want to travel towards something, you could point that at something. And then depending on how you're navigating towards that object, like Marco Polo, we could give you vibratory feedback about whether or not you're either closer or farther away. Um, not dissimilar from how Swan was using spatialized audio to give you chirps that scaled um, when you got closer to something uh, versus less frequent when you got farther away from it. Um, so this is something we're also actively exploring and we've published uh, a paper on this as well. Um, so um, probably two or three more quick things. Um, so this is one of our feedback belts. This is kind of a precursor to the actuators are in the waist strap. Um, I just want to show you, we've spent a lot of time trying to build these really cool vibration units that are much more kind of sophisticated than what you'd find in a cell phone. We have them in different belt configurations and they're kind of run by two different software scripts. One that helps, con you know, we're concerned more about the computer vision providing the input and the other one that's kind of controlling the actual vibration itself through the actuators or what's providing the touch feedback. And here's a little bit of data about us um, performing delay analyses. So end to end, as soon as I get an image, how long does it take me to deliver a vibratory response? Um, so how quickly can I generate some information to the end user? Uh, how long does it take this book bag to respond so I can give you a cue, basically, end to end? Um, and this uh, paper here, um, we've been able to get it down so far um, to 100 milliseconds, which is pretty impressive because that's about the same time as a large eye movement. So by the time that it takes for you to kind of move your eyes from you know, kind of left field to right field, um, we're able to process information and provide a vibratory prompt, um, which we think is a pretty good starting point. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this. Um, I'm just going to move on. Um, here's an indoor example of how this belt works. Um, we can provide basic hazard mapping that's very intuitive. So you have these kind of um, vibration units that are in the waist straps. You have a hiking book bag. You have like two straps that you kind of buckle for payload distribution. And there are vibration units on the left and on the right. And basically the way it works is we take an image and we separate it into little rectangles. And depending on how many vibration units we have, that's how many um, uh, little rectangles we create that we call capture fields. If an object or obstacle comes in that capture field, we can then create a little vibratory cue. And this is through, um, uh, we do this in a scheme uh, that's spatiotopically preserved. So left is left, right is right. So if there's an object on the left, we vibrate you on the left. If it's on the right, on the right. And then as it gets closer to you, we do an inverse, um, we basically inversely transform that. So it, as the object is, you know, um, only two feet from you, the frequency would be higher. As it's 20 feet from you, the frequency would be much lower. Um, and then if there's a plurality of obstacles, we have to determine salience, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, but through simple tasks, like this chair being directly in front of you, um, the, the, the vibration unit that's kind of closer to your midline would, would vibrate. Um, and then because it's, you know, four to five feet, it would vibrate with a specific intensity or frequency um, and duty cycle. And what's cool about this is this kind of hazard mapping, you respond very quickly to these, to, to these, um, to these tactile cues. And we don't need to give you a lot of semantic information so you can kind of weave around if you're navigating through a congested space without getting a lot of high level detail about what's in that information. Um, but you can you know, change modes between how this is set up. So um, this gives a, a flavor for how this would work. So we're navigating, um, so this is an indoor office setting. We identified that there's a chair there. Um, and then here's streaming data coming into the belt on the lower left. So I'll go through this. Um, I'm gonna show just a quick video uh, that basically just shows us navigating through a city park. Um, we identify the capture fields where there are benches or barrier posts. And then here's a binary decision on the lower right showing that we're identifying and turning these vibration units on, on the lower left. So the person would walk right, which is what happens. As he walks right, he realizes there's some more barrier posts. So then he can course correct again to navigate around the barrier post. And then very quickly, he can navigate through a new city park that he's not familiar with, whereas it would take much longer in another situation. Okay, so all this sounds really cool, but you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of data to handle. A lot of these devices have some pretty impressive, you know, they have some, uh, you know, some pretty impressive claims, 
but what's actually happening in terms of the video analytics and how do we actually handle all the streaming video? These are important considerations and we have some grants where we're actually currently exploring this at a foundational level. So we're actually looking at what does it mean to, to adapt the video feed and the bit rate of the video with different compression, um, uh, basically different uh, compression strategies. Um, so how can we compress uh, the video adaptively at different times, depending on the bandwidth that we have for this type of data? And what's really cool about this, if we're in environments with different bandwidth uh, limitations, so for example, on the right here, you can see, can I actually provide some level of assistance at a basic level on my, my device itself using like a little microcontroller or even a cell phone? But then if, if I'm in a 4G or a 5G environment, am I then able to increase the amount of information that I'm getting with high definition uh, images? And then I can actually perform more functionality. So what actually happens is, as you can see here in the schematic, my performance increases. But what's really nice is as I perform more of this off of the device and either on the edge or in the cloud, which is what we're hearing about more, I save significantly on power. So now we're looking at kind of adaptive power um, and how we can look at power constraints and get past power constraints for these devices, which means, you know, a device may last two hours of runtime, but can we actually extend the, the battery life to eight hours if we do, you know, um, it, you know, uh, if, if we can create these adaptive uh, strategies, um, all of which we're creating. We're, we're working on some COVID projects as well, which I'm going to skip. And we have some pilots with the MTA and the DOT looking at kind of building out some of their apps. And um, we have um, uh, a couple of new um, uh, projects where we're, we're trying to create some new, um, some, some new tools, some new applications that could be um, as simple as a download on a cell phone that can help characterize mobility. Um, and if those are interested, I, I would love to engage further um, and then use that as kind of a, a, of a baseline to then see what, what strategies are most useful for you as you move forward um, in, in daily activities. And so we're working with some partners on that. So here are a couple screenshots. I apologize, I'm moving quickly, but I realize um, I should leave time for questions and I've gone too long. Um, but here's kind of a little bit of a snapshot about how some mobility information can be displayed on an application, showing how much activity you've had um, on an average day, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, color-coded, um, and some incoming video feed. Um, and then uh, I'll, land, uh, I'll end by saying we're, we're in a new pilot with the UN, uh, uh, potentially to create some new, or collaborate on some new uh, accessibility um, technology, which we're really excited about, and potentially using some of these wearables um, uh, for some of their, um, uh, uh, their new plans uh, for 2021. And I have to thank uh, many, many people um, on um, uh, in many, many areas. Um, and this is just, um, you know, a, a bit uh, of them. So thank you so much for your attention. And I'm um, sorry that was a bit rushed at the end. We could probably loop back. Uh, and also thanks so much to um, uh, uh, the, the CRF. And, um, uh, you know, thanks to you all uh, for participating in this uh, awesome foundation. So um, I'll stop screen sharing and take any questions. Wow, I feel like I just ran a marathon and I didn't even, you know, do anything like that. <laughs> that was a lot of great information. And I, I guarantee there's going to be some questions coming in as I'm asking the ones that have come in thus far. Um, no so I think we'll, great. we're going to go about 10 more minutes, guys. And, and then anything, any other questions, we'll be sure to share them with our audience that, that was here today. Um, okay, here's the first one from Neil. Um, for people who like to run or to jog, is this is a, is any of the models that you presented today effective for that? Great question. So you know, um, running and jogging um, is a little more challenging in that obviously the speed is increased, and you know we have to be mindful of you know what what we're trying to um, uh, you know compute um, in terms of the back end and also locally. Um, you know, the other consideration is that um, when you're running uh, and we're doing kind of body-based uh, video um, and streaming uh, is that uh, there are some considerations with artifacts uh, from the actual images themselves, uh, meaning kind of jitter and blur and, and things that um, uh, could be affected. The good news is that there are more techniques to try and account for that. So um, uh, do I think that um, running and jogging are going to be a little bit more challenging? Yes. But do I think that we can get past them? Um, I do think so. So we haven't done, in total transparency, we have not done anything um, involved involving kind of higher jogging or running speeds. Um, 
but I do think that um, uh, that that will be um, uh, surmountable um, given uh, given our approaches. Um, uh, you know, paying particularly you know particular attention to some of the um, uh, you know some of the some of the artifacts uh, from a from an image standpoint. Thank you. You know, we I shot you an email about this last night, Jr. But I'm going to revisit it because there another is a person that had a question. Sure. Um, second sight is something that you know we a lot of us are familiar with, and especially maybe the second generation Onyx that was that that was being explored at one point. Mm -hmm. um, it, it had a component possibly with face facial recognition. Do you have anything, or do you know of anything that is in line with that type of of research? or a wearable, it, that was a more of an implantable, right? Um, so can you yeah. talk to that? Uh, do you mean like, as it relates to, is the question more like, as it relates to, are there synergies between this wearable and retinal prostheses or? I'm not sure. Yes, that could uh, possibly be. Or, oh, and, or is there any of the um, prosthetics that you could, are wearables that would have um, facial recognition? Um, so I think, you know, so, um, so, so to, to, I'll answer the last question first, because that's the easiest one. The wearables as it relates to facial recognition, definitely. Um, it depends on the approach. Um, you know, creating facial recognition in some of these devices is certainly something that's surmountable given um, current techniques. Um, the biggest question comes down to cybersecurity. Um, and so how do you create the right um, uh, policies around that? Um, and I know some have tried to avoid that and just you know um, handle everything locally, which is certainly a way to do that. Uh, but then you're drastically limiting your opportunity for databasing and saving and also cross pollinating, um, and so you know that becomes an issue. So um, uh, you know we collaborate with some cybersecurity experts. I think these these are all kind of part of our future. I mean, kind of uh, you know facial identities and and what's being used by the government and security agencies are kind of you know be be part of what what what. Is, is, is our uh, kind of our fingerprint, if you will, moving forward. Um, and I, I think it's, um, it, it's uh, a cornerstone of what potentially could be very helpful um, as a smart service system, particularly for visual disability. Um, so I just think we need to, uh, you know, build in the right type of um, uh, cybersecurity intelligence. Um, as it relates to um, articulating with retinal prostheses, if it's just retinal prostheses and doing facial recognition, you wouldn't need any type of an advanced wearable like this to afford facial recognition. Some of the camera technologies that they have would probably be sufficient to perform the facial recognition. If it's pr providing additional um, functionality where um, there could be, you know, um, you know, two or three different technologies that are working together in a suite um, in order to provide a, a more integrated platform, I'm a big fan. So, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, could we see a future, um, you know, five, 10 years from now where there's potentially um, a, a more seamless integration of a retinal prosthesis and, and many still may be against it, even if it is you know, more sophisticated, but could some, you know, opt for that plus a more advanced wearable with what I'd like to consider kind of supplementals, meaning kind of appendicular based or hand based wrist based tech plus more head based tech. Um, I'm all for it. I'm a little preferential towards going torso based as a, as a foundation. And I can speak to that as to why in terms of rationale. Um, but I, I do think if you're talking about kind of a suite of, uh, you know, an integrated platform and a, and a suite, yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. lots of synergies possible. Awesome. The, the grand question that several people have, of course, asked is how long before some of these wearables become available to the public? Um, how much would they cost and just timelines? Sure. So it's hard to, you know, to, to pick a particular timeline. A lot of it depends on, and if anyone has any thoughts on anything that they saw that would be more user friend or more useful in the beginning, it's been difficult to decide kind of what ultimately should we put in the first generation? Um, and then, you know, what should we launch with earlier on? So, you know, I mean, ultimately what we consider is it'll probably be kind of a a, a basic package that will, you know, probably come with one or two microservices. And then over time it will evolve and microservices will be delivered through, uh, through the web um, and through cyber. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be able to uh, adapt. Uh, if anyone has any particular or kind of uh, felt more excited about particular services that I described, feel free to let me know. We're kind of currently walking through um, figuring out what makes most sense. And then also the embodiment. Um, that's kind of been a bit of a challenge is figuring out um, 
the right way to get the form factor um, uh, into uh, a mature enough state. Um, and we've, you know, kind of gone back and forth on that in terms of, so, so timeline, if we decide on one or two, it would be hard. I mean, I'd love to get something out in the next year and a half, two years, um, uh, you know, something commercial, but it depends on if we decide maybe three microservices or three functionalities versus four, and then what we decide on form factor and obviously, you know, technology, there are delays in terms of cost. Um, I can't really settle on a cost right now, but I can tell you the units that we have, I can tell you what's involved. Um, the good news is that the development boards that we use, 200 bucks, not very expensive. The stereo cameras that we use, even at full retail, are about 400 bucks, and they're very strong. Um, and then, you know, the book bags, I mean, they're nothing. I mean, they're, you know, $9 if we get them at scale. Um, and the actuators are, are pretty reasonable. Um, they've come down already uh, four, uh, four times. They, initially, when we first ordered these actuator chips, they were 200 bucks each and now they're down to less than 50 um, over the last three years. Um, so, you know, the, the cost of goods um, uh, is, you know, well under, for what I was showing you with a stereo camera, a microcontroller dev kit, uh, the, again, depending on what we'd want to do, um, you know, the book bag, the actuator, the headset, I mean, we're talking well under, well under a thousand dollars in terms of cost of goods. And a lot of that isn't with economies of scale pricing. So, you know, that just gives you a sense of where we're at. I mean, I'm hoping we can build, um, you know, pretty appetizing uh, wearables that can really, um, you know, be quite powerful. And that, you know, that stereo system itself is quite expensive when we're currently exploring uh, kind of building a more custom setup that would probably drop that price point down considerably. Um, you know, I mean, I'd love to see a product that's closer to 500, 600 bucks. Um, but, you know, we'll, um, you know, we'll see. And, you know, we're, we're very optimistic. We're trying to see if we can get more connected uh, politically and um, with different lobbying groups, because I'd love to see a device that can speak to safety also reimbursed by private payers, um, obviously CMS as well. Um, but um, that'll take more time. <laughs> that's a lot of work. That's, that's really encouraging, that dollar amount. That's something that's quite affordable to many people. So I think we're going to wrap it up. This is but I wanted to say, as you were asking for feedback, we send out a survey, folks. Um, and when you get your survey, I think it's five or six questions. At the very end, it gives you an ability to give comments. So anything that you provide to us in the in the survey, we'll pass on um, to Dr. Rizzo. Um, and maybe two in the survey, if you could specifically say what would be of interest to learn more of, we'll make sure that maybe we can do this again. Uh, and have more time with um, Dr. JR. And um, we just so appreciate your time. I love the brain, big, you know. <laughs> my, my pleasure, thank you all. Thanks to everyone for, you know, their support of the community. And uh, if we don't talk, I hope everyone has a fantastic holiday season and please stay safe. Uh, so we'll talk more soon. We're really encouraged here. There's a new message that just came in. I want to make sure. Yeah, fantastic. Dr. McDonald just said, Ian McDonald, thanks for the great experience. You know, we had several of our researchers that were on the call today. Um, so it's something that's really important, not only to us as consumers and people whose vision are, are affected, but also to the docs because they wanted the researchers too. So we're so grateful, JR. Thank you so much. And we're oh. so excited that you're on board and you're on our team. And um, you know firsthand what it's like to be having this vision change. So it's um, it's great. Just fabulous. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you to all the doctors um, who've, you know, been there for support and to help us along the way. And, uh, you know, if we can help provide solutions, that can be a second part of the prescription that you write to afford more you know, functional assistance to those in need and, and work with uh, the CHM family. We're, we're thrilled. So, uh, you know, so thank you. Uh, thank you again. Um, and, uh, you know, really looking forward to um, to next steps. Absolutely. One other time, we want to make sure we thank our, our um, sponsors, Allergan and Biogen for their, their funding and their support. And everybody have a wonderful holiday. There's some more webinars coming up, some festive ones. Um, you might want to check out the emails that you're getting from Corey. And otherwise, we'll see you again. Thanks Great. so much. Thank Thanks, you so John. Much, everyone. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.